Well guys, we made it. When I first started this channel, I never imagined that I'd be reviewing something so anger-inducing and so abysmal that had the audacity to bear the dragon's name. I have a ton that I wanna go over, but first I do wanna talk about a couple of things before we get started. If you're someone who frequents my channel often, you know that I'm not one of those creators who bitches about viewers not subscribing every video. As a viewer myself, that shit gets very annoying and it's been a personal choice to not do it. But in the case that this video picks up in any way, and considering I've been doing this for over a year now, I would really like to make it to a thousand subscribers in the near future. And it has nothing to do with monetization. Trust me, have you ever heard me talk? Like, ever? My shit's not getting monetized, okay? I like to think of it as more of a confirmation that people enjoy the stuff that I do and they want to see me do more. The more subscribers I get, the more I understand that people want me to do this. So if you are not subscribed, please consider doing so and check out some of my other videos if you're interested. I do movie reviews, show reviews, <laughs> make fun of content, it's great. Next, and going back to the Nine Realms, as angry as I was in my trailer review, I did go into this show wanting to give it a chance. The How to Train Your Dragon franchise is like my baby. Do you really think I would want something that's so shitty to be incorporated in it? I wanted the Nine Realms to be good. Was it as bad as I was expecting? Yes. I went back and forth for a long time on how exactly I was going to format this video. I thought about talking about every episode individually, and then talking about certain subjects as I noticed them as the episodes progressed, or just talking about the subjects first and then going into the episodes later. And I think the former is what I'm going to end up doing. So if for some reason you came to this video to only hear me talk about one specific episode, just know that if you skip to that point in the video, you're going to miss me talking about other things as well. And this is also just a blanket statement before I say anything else. If you have a problem with this show or agree with the negative comments that I'm about to make about it, do not go after the people who made it, okay? I'm talking about the showrunners, the writers, whoever. Just don't go after them. If I had a left nut, I would bet it. DreamWorks as a corporation is probably probably behind 99% of the decisions that were made with this series. Now with that in mind, I am going to be addressing some of the production team that we see in the episode, but all jokes that I'm about to make aside, I know that this really wasn't their fault. How much control did they really have over this thing? Probably none. Obviously there are spoilers ahead for the Nine Realms. It's okay if you haven't already seen the show, I'm gonna be talking about pretty much everything that happens plot-wise, but if you are going to strongly agree or disagree with my opinion, I do think you should give it a watch first. It's only six episodes, so if you're going to bash it, like I'm about to, you should at least give it a chance. So I'm gonna be talking about some of the reasons why this show exists in the first place, the few that I could find, some things that I actually enjoyed about the show, go into talking about every episode individually, give my overall thoughts in a conclusion, and then address some of the comments that were left on my trailer reaction. So if you left a comment on that video, stick around to the end, I might be responding to it. So without further ado, strap in fellow Dragonites, it's gonna be a long one. <laughs> Before I delve into everything that makes this show the heaping pile of garbage we all knew it was going to be, there's a question that's been stuck on all of our minds since the first announcement back in October. And that question is... Why? Yeah. Why was another How to Train Your Dragon spinoff show necessary? Aside from the canonical franchise, you have Rescue Riders, which, as I've already stated in my trailer review, I'm not offended by because it's been officially confirmed that Rescue Riders doesn't take place in the same universe as the films and Dragons the Nine Realms definitely does. Just a fair warning going forward, 90% of this review is going to be me comparing the Nine Realms with other official How to Train Your Dragon shows, including Riders, Defenders, and Race to the Edge. Some of you may think this is unfair of me, given that the Nine Realms takes place hundreds of years after the official end of Hiccup and Toothless's story, but I think it's very fair, given that they're clearly relying on the sole success of the other shows to gain popularity. If they weren't, then they wouldn't have started the the entire show off with a storybook opening that references the original franchise. I'll primarily be referring back to Race to the Edge when I make these comparisons, and this is for a variety of reasons. Mostly because, due to the point in time it was released, there is a ton of information that I can look back on and make accurate comparisons between it and the Nine Realms. But also because, come on, everyone knows Race to the Edge is superior to Riders and Defenders. Not saying the Cartoon Network series was bad by any means, but Race to the Edge was just way more enjoyable for many fans, myself included. I'm also not trying to imply that Race to the Edge is a completely perfect show. It certainly has its drawbacks and bad episodes, but considering what the production team was given to work with, they really went above and beyond. 
Back in 2015, the How to Train Your Dragon fandom was still coming off the high that was the second movie that premiered in summer 2014. Those who followed the release date of the DVD, because this was before digital release was a thing, remember the quirky and well-received short Dawn of the Dragon Racers that came out as a bonus for the DVD release of the second film. Setting the plot aside, the short primarily takes place using the models of the characters when they were around post-defenders of Burke Age. But in the opening and closing of the short, newer, never-before-seen models of the characters were used. Not quite the age they were in the second movie, but far beyond what we'd seen of them in the Cartoon Network series. It was also around this time that word began to spread of a new TV show premiering that was said to bridge the gap between Defenders of Burke and the second movie. At the time, being around late 2014, little was known about the new series besides this fact. Fans began speculating about the eventual release, and with the premiere of these new models in Dawn of the Dragon Racers, were able to put two and two together that these models were likely to be used in the new series, which ended up being correct. But, as I've already stated, very little was known about the validity of these speculations. At the time, it began to spread that the new show was going to be called Dragons Masters of Burke, following in line with Riders and Defenders. To this day, I have no idea where this title came from, or if it was just a placeholder for what would eventually become Race to the Edge. But, in early 2015, we got our answer, and an official announcement revealed that Race to the Edge would premiere on Netflix in the summer of that year. Prior to this release date, the executive producers of the show, Art Brown and Doug Sloan, did a variety of interviews, many of which the fandom dissected for their own amusement, and which added to the anticipation for the release of the show. Now, my point in going through all of this is to say that Art and Doug were very aware that the How to Train Your Dragon fanbase was extremely active, and therefore, reception to their interviews regarding the new show would only do good things for their ratings once it premiered. So, what does all of this have to do with the Nine Realms? I dare you to find a single interview where the creators of this new show go on record and state why the hell it even exists in the first place. John Telligan, who was an avid crew member of the previous Dragon shows, is one of the primary creators here. While he did his part in promoting the new show on his personal Twitter account, the only interviews I could find where he discusses anything about the show were very limited in all post-release. In fact, pretty much the only news source even discussing the Nine Realms comes from this website, Polygon, which I'd never heard of before doing research for this video. And after scrolling through the articles I could find, I seriously doubt the credibility of the writer responsible, as they stated that the animation is, quote, on par with the previous Dragon shows. I'll be going more into excruciating detail about why this statement is so wrong later on, but please take my word for it. It's wrong. What I found most amusing in the interview with John Telligan is that they actually try to pretend that this show makes any type of statement. One of the benefits of moving into the modern times is that it allows us to play with themes that are more current, like climate change and animal rights, things that are important to our modern day society that Vikings may not have cared so much about. I'm sorry. What? What the fuck? Look, it's all fine and dandy if you want to include themes like that in your kids' show, but after sitting through this abysmal train wreck twice, literally neither of these issues are mentioned. The vague threat of overpowerful corporations hurting the dragons if they were discovered is the only thing that comes even close to this. I know a lot of money-hungry corporations are evil, okay? But isn't it just super ironic that this show is preaching that message when the very nature of its existence stems from a money-hungry corporation milking one of the most prominent franchises in history for content? Anyway, I'm done trying to figure out why this show exists. No one knows. I don't even think the producers know. DreamWorks just threw a bunch of spinning plates in the air and told them to make a new dragon show, and this is what we got. It's dog shit, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. I was gonna go into stuff that I liked about it before I completely tore it to shreds. The real question is, was there anything I liked about it? Well... Spoiler alert, there isn't much. I like the Mist Twister dragon. The design's pretty dumb, but the functionality of one head breathing fire and the other breathing ice makes for a really awesome and practical attack mechanism. I also like the Feather Hide dragon. Its ability to not only cloak itself like a change wing, but also mimic sounds was really cool. It makes me wish these dragons had existed in the other shows, where they would have actually been given something interesting to do. The voice acting was fine, for the most part. Jeremy Schrader probably did the best out of anyone, no surprise there. The music was pretty dull most of the time, but there were scenes where I enjoyed the subtle ways they reinvented the classic How to Train Your Dragon themes. They could have just ripped off the original soundtrack, but they actually tried doing something different while still paying tribute to its origins. At times, it worked pretty well. 
I really wasn't attached to any of the main characters by the end of the show other than Alex, and she was definitely the most relatable of the bunch. Probably won't say map to the secret cave. Hi. Uh, where did you come from? I was born in Tuscaloosa. At least for me. While her design is overtly cartoonish like the rest of the characters, there are little pieces of it that I liked. They managed to make her endearing and cute enough without making her look fucking ridiculous. While I'm sure a lot of people are going to be praising the show for diversity among characters, it certainly isn't something I'm gonna give it points for. It's cool that they want to make sure people feel represented, but to me, stuff like race and sexuality are nothing more than character traits. That would be like me saying I like a show more or less because one of the characters has brown hair. While I personally don't consider it an addition to quality, I don't see it as a bad thing either. I mean, it's something you can forgive the original franchise for, given that it took place in Viking Age Scandinavia. Aside from Krogan, some of the Wing Maidens, and a select few characters in the comics, it makes sense that there wouldn't be much diversity in the location and time period. Now, while this doesn't make the show any better for me, I can understand how it does for certain people. If I were a kid who had gay parents and saw it depicted in a natural, completely conventional way in a show like this, I'd probably get more out of it, and that's totally fine. It makes sense given the location and time period that there would be an assortment of more diverse characters, and I'm glad that's the route that they chose to take. Um, alright, anything else I liked? Uh, I guess Tom's relationship with his mom was pretty wholesome. I enjoyed the scenes where they were interacting away from the other characters. Uh, I liked this line. Not like this! I'm too young! I have a cat! I'm really reaching here, guys. Oh, I liked all the memes that came from this show. Yeah, the fandom did really good on this one. It, yep, yep, that's about it. Let's get this shit over with. Episode 1 starts and we're immediately greeted to a Shrek-style storybook prologue where the original franchise is referenced via the pages of the book. Something tells me that this was strategically placed at the beginning of the first episode just to confirm to viewers that may still be confused that this show is trying to base itself around the original How to Train Your Dragon material while still being its own thing. Keyword there is trying. So what was my reaction as one of the How to Train Your Dragon super fans they were pandering to? Well, luckily I was recording it. Oh my god, no. No! No! We're only 10 seconds in! We learn that the Nine Realms is set 1300 years after Hiccup and Toothless bonded and dragons became positively ingrained in Viking society. You may be thinking, well, that just means it's set in modern day, right? And that's a great question. I don't fucking know the answer, but it's a good question. And it wasn't something I actually put two and two together on until I saw a comment on my trailer reaction pointing it out. But according to those really weird How to Train Your Dragon Olympic ads that came out back when the first movie was released, the film was supposedly set in 1010 AD. So does this mean the Nine Realms takes place in 2310? All the technology is present day, so I'm assuming that isn't what they were going for. Now this is something that I'm willing to forgive, seeing as that it wasn't something the original franchise was very consistent with either. There was a reason I did not include these ads in my chronological analysis of the How to Train Your Dragon universe in my trailer review. Because, and I know you'll find this really hard to believe, I'd see the world. Ah, huh, what do you know? It's round. I don't think these are canon. But I decided to do my own research anyway and found that the Viking era lasted from around 800 to 1100 AD. Let's give the Nine Realms the benefit of the doubt and say that How to Train Your Dragon took place on the early end of that. But the problem is, it's literally impossible for that to be true. I have to assume that Hiccup and Toothless's lifespan took place around the very latter end of this time frame, given that in Race to the Edge, they're seen celebrating Burke's 400 year anniversary. So unless Burke didn't start out as a Viking settlement, which would be contradicting pre pretty much the entire Haddock family history that we see, How to Train Your Dragon definitely took place at bare minimum after 1000 AD. Jun Wong. Present in this dimensional timeline. Are you sure about that? Again, take all of this with a grain of salt because the original franchise wasn't consistent with it either. There's a point in Homecoming where they make a reference to the Black Plague. That's a great idea, but we've only got four days until Snoggle talk at me. Three if you don't count Black Plague Friday. Yeah, nothing gets done. Everybody's just shopping and coughing. Which happened in 1346. So I think the real issue here is that abso-fucking-nobody at DreamWorks bothered keeping track of any of this. But just 
Why 1300? It's such a weird number. Just say it takes place 1000 years after it and my entire two minute rant could have been avoided. Now, where was I? Oh yeah, four seconds into the first episode. Episode one is titled First Flight Part One. We see a meteor crashing into Earth and then we're introduced to the main character, Tom Cullerson, with his scientist adventurer mother, Olivia. The two are flying to a huge fissure that's opened since, I, guess the meteor had something to do with it? If a meteor struck Earth, wouldn't there just be a big crater? Why is this a trench? Why couldn't there just been a big earthquake that opened up the fissure? Also, this meteor is never even referenced later on, so I don't know what the point of showing it was. Project Icarus is its name. One of the main issues I take with this whole setup is that it's never really revealed what Tom's mother and the other researchers are here to do other than stare into a hole. Get in the hole! Get in my hole! It just ends up being a bunch of scientists jerking off while their children make repeated suicide attempts. They end up sending in a drone or two, but that's pretty much it. The adults never actually do anything. They never explore the fissure until they're literally forced to in the last episode because the base is under threat of collapsing. Is this really worth a billion dollars, so you say? They've invested a billion dollars into this expedition. Anyway, when we arrive, we learn some really stellar information about our protagonist. He's a fucking suicidal moron who climbed into a polar bear exhibit when he was six. The last time I saw you, you jumped into the polar bear habitat at the zoo. <laughs> oh, sorry. He's not an idiot. He's just adventurous. Then we're introduced to the other main characters and their scientist parents. There's June, who's like an astronomer nerd who's obsessed with zodiac charts. I, I think. I know like nothing about that shit, don't crucify me. And she ends up being Tom's love interest, kinda. Then there's D'Angelo, whose only trait is army brat. That's not my term. Remember those two articles I cited earlier? Yeah, that's literally the only term John Telligan uses to describe him. Then there's Alex, who's a really shy tech nerd. Again, I found her to be the most endearing out of the four, but she doesn't really get much screen time until Featherhide, so more on that later. We're only five minutes into the episode, and by now you may have noticed one of the most glaring problems that I and many other fans have with its production. Let's see if you can guess what it is. Okay, keep looking around. A little longer. What about this shot? Notice anything? Yes. <clears throat> Why does everyone look so fucking weird? These character models are abysmal. Everyone looks like they're still stuck in the rendering stage. They look like fucking concept art. The only one who looks even comparable to the other dragon shows is Tom. His proportions, his rendering, his features, they look like they might belong in Race to the Edge. He's the only one they spent time on. Everyone else looks like a goddamn plastic action figure. Like, look at him next to his mom. Why does she look like that? They don't even look like they're from the same damn animated show, let alone she gave birth to this fucking e-boy. I don't mean to idolize Race to the Edge for the billionth time in the first half of this video, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Race to the Edge had some weird character designs. I'm not gonna deny it. There were times when the producers were lazy with extras, there were certain characters that looked more distinguishable than others, but there was never a time in that show where a character looked like they genuinely did not belong in that universe. Everyone looked like they were from the same show. Tom visibly stands out from the other characters and not in a good way. Either make him as cartoonish as everyone else or make everyone else look like human beings. Do not put effort into only your protagonist and say fuck it when modeling everyone Everyone else. And speaking of their models, I hate them. Like I said, the only character whose design I didn't totally hate was Alex. Yes, she's freakishly cartoonish compared to Tom, but there's personality in her design. D'Angelo looks generic and plasticky, and June looks like she was designed by a crackhead. Oh, I know, we're gonna do a color thing with our characters because color means things in stories. So we're gonna make June wear purple, and because she wears purple, let's make her eyes purple. <laughs> Why the f Fuck are her eyes purple? Big purple eyes waving. Her eyes were waving? <laughs> They're purple. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, what the fuck? In Race to the Edge, not only were the main characters' designs realistic and consistent in the confines of their animated world, but they were strategically designed to mirror their unique dragons in a non-obnoxiously obvious way. Hiccup wears red because Toothless's tail fin is red. Stormfly is blue, so Astrid wears blue. Meatlug is brown, so Fishlegs wears brown. Razor Rips are silver, so Heather and the 
Wing Maidens wear silver armor. Skull Crusher is green, so Stoic wears green. The only real exceptions to this are Snotloud and the Twins, but even then it could be said that the Twins mirror Barf and Belch's horns with their helmets, and Snotloud mirrors Hookfang's scale patterns with the texture of his armor. My point is, Race to the Edge actually fucking tried. You know stuff like character design is supposed to matter, right? Don't worry, we'll get into the stupid designs of the dragons later. But this is the introduction to your brand new Blank Slate show and you're blowing it so fucking hard. I actually have a friend who's about to graduate with a degree in animation and I sent her the trailer of this show for her to react to and her response was, that's a hot pile of shit. You know what I can say about the Nine Realms that I can't say about Race to the Edge? Is the fact that the Nine Realms actually has blades of grass. It was refreshing to see. Riders, defenders, and Race to the Edge never had actual grass. So, fine. Good job. I'm so proud of you. But goddamn, is this what comes at the expense of having grass? Everything looks like shit? So the kids are told that they have three rules. One, go to school. Two, stay away from the fissure. And three, make sure you stay away from the fissure. Only they aren't shown going to school even once in the entire season. They hardly even go into this room that was designed specifically for them to stay in all day. They're pretty much allowed to run around and do whatever, I guess. Anyway, surprise, surprise, Tom gets into some shit right away when he steps outside, and 10 seconds later, there's an earthquake. Oh, shit! <laughs> See, Tom isn't just adventurous, he's also heroic. Kinda like... Also, this is the first instance of many of this skinny 14-year-old boy having superhuman strength. Later in the same episode, he's able to move a whole ass boulder and drive a pickaxe into literal stone while falling and not only support his body weight with one arm, but climb the stone wall with the pickaxe. Yes, like Wonder Woman. And later in the season, he does the exact same thing while holding June. I don't want to hear anyone comparing this to that scene in Race to the Edge's finale because not only was Hiccup driving his sword into ice, not stone, but he was also shown to be physically winded from pulling his weight up only a few feet, as anyone would be. Also, I hate to burst your dweeb-loving bubble, but string bean looking Hiccup has been proven to actually be very fucking strong. Remember Thor's mighty hammer? You heard me. Come on, hit me! You know you want to. Fine, but remember. You wanted this. <laughs> okay, I just really wanted to bring up that scene. It's one of my favorites in the whole show. My point is he sword fights, he forges, he spends a lot of time doing physically demanding things, so it makes sense that he's actually very strong. What the fuck does this guy do? He looks like he spends all day playing Fortnite and jerking off to anime. How is he this strong? Are you okay? Mom, mom. Hi, I I'm fine. I just saw something. If you notice that glitch in his mother's hair when she hugs him, that was not my recording software. I even went back and watched the streamed version to double check and it was still there. Guess it's the price we pay for blades of grass. It was around this time that I also began to notice that the pacing with the dialogue is very off. There always seems to be this unnatural pause between when one character stops speaking and another starts. I'm gonna try and convey it without getting copyright claims, but if you don't believe me, just watch any of the episodes for yourself because it stays that way for the whole season. Time for another comparison between this show and Race to the Edge, because 30 seconds without one is too long. Now, considering there are 76 episodes of Race to the Edge for me to cherry pick in only six of the nine realms, I think it's only fair that I compare the dialogue from one of the first six episodes of the first Race to the Edge season to the dialogue here. Which means I'm picking only between Dragon Eye of the Beholder Part 1 and Gone Gustav- oh, Wait a fucking minute! Oh my god, I didn't even realize this until this point in the script, but I finally feel figured out who this e-boy reminds me of. Fucking Gustav. If you're unfamiliar, Gustav was an annoying, misbehaving, arrogant, horny little shit who destroyed everything he touched and drove the dragon riders up a fucking wall. He was basically known as Mini Snotlout, even naming his monstrous nightmare Fang Hook. I can't even really explain why, but these two give off identical energy to me. They even have the same speaking pattern. It's kind of scary. I just wanted to prove myself. I just wanted to see the drone fleet. Anyway, back to the pacing. To be ex Extra fair to the Nine Realms, I'll be choosing a scene with a similar context to examine side by side. Let's take a look at the post-earthquake scene in the Nine Realms in comparison to the post-Snow Wraith attack in Dragon Eye of the Beholder Part 2. Both scenes that take place after an intense event wherein characters discuss the result and how they are to proceed going forward. Pay attention to the pacing in this Race to the Edge scene. That thing was gnarly. Astrid, are you okay? Yep, barely. Hiccup, you know I want a shot at this as badly as you? 
But maybe we should get out of here. We're just sitting ducks in the storm. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Sitting ducks. Yes, 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 that's exactly what we need to be. Excuse me? It sees body heat in the same way Toothless can find things with sound. We'll use this to our advantage to confuse it. Then, while it's distracted, we'll net it and get that tooth. And you're sure it will work? Uh, I hate you. You know that. Yes, I am aware of that. Compared to the pacing in this scene from the Nine Realms. What happened? Earthquake. Falling. <laughs> Screams. Death riding toward me on a pale horse. Saved her life. Thomas, what are you doing down here? This is a restricted area. Oh, I... Uh... Wait a minute. You weren't supposed to be down here? From now on, he will only be where he's supposed to be. Right? Uh... One moment, Olivia. I think we were both hoping that Tom had matured beyond the swimming with polar bears phase of his development. He has. I promise you, May. In the first scene, the viewer is still feeling the intensity of the situation, even though the characters were no longer in danger. It felt like we'd just survived an attack from a widely unknown dragon. We felt what the characters were feeling. Everything about this scene felt awkward, like they had to slow it down for fear that the viewers wouldn't understand what was happening. We just saw this superhuman e-boy save a woman's life, and it's almost jarring how slow the pacing becomes in the scene directly after. No, this is not me nitpicking. Here's the thing about critiquing media like shows and movies. You learn very quickly that everything matters, and it's easy to tell when the makers were being creatively lazy. For example, weak dialogue in a single scene might be something you could let slide if you weren't already irritated by the terrible character designs, awkward pacing, and shit animation. These things add up to make the show. The whole show. Even with animation errors like Olivia's hair, it isn't the fact alone that there was an error. Race to the Edge had things clipping into other things all the time, but nine times out of ten, these were hardly noticeable. Olivia's hair is in the center of the shot, there's no music, no dynamic camera work to distract us from it. It just screams that they knew it was there and out of laziness didn't fix it. It does not help their case that this is the first episode of the whole series and should theoretically be the most spotless of the bunch. Out of 76 Race to the Edge episodes, which equates to over 27 hours of runtime, there was only one major error in the whole show that I found completely unforgivable, and it was season 3 episode 11 when Snotlout was shown to be catching Dagger on the edge with the other riders when he was supposed to be on a scouting mission with Heather. It was a major continuity error that should not have happened. But that's it. Out of six 13-episode seasons, that's the only gigantic mistake that comes to mind. Anyway, back to the e-boy. But come on, Mom. We come from Vikings. We don't ask for permission. We don't care what other people think. We crave adventure. <sighs> Hey, this is kind of fun. Okay, easy. These things are expensive. I got it, I got it. <laughs> Poor thing. I'm so sorry. <sighs> Never the <laughs> sheep before. So by this point, Tom has seen a mysterious creature flying around the inside of the fissure on numerous occasions, and because he's a dumbass, he tries to figure out what it is. So he sends in his drone to see if he can find anything, which again is pretty much all the adults at this project have been doing, so it's very unclear why Tom would be the only one to actually find anything. Do you guys even care, or are you actually here to fuck around and do nothing? Also at this point, the adults have told Tom to stay away from the fissure a multitude of times. So what does he do? goes inside of it, what else? I'm sorry, but this e-boy just does not have the same appeal or motivations that Hiccup had in movie one, which I'm certain they were trying to replicate. Movie one Hiccup wasn't just making inventions because he could, he was doing it to help protect the people of the village even though they belittled him for it. Was he doing it for personal gain as well? Absolutely. But it was because his life fucking sucked. He was the son of the chief and therefore faced a ton of expectation that he was constantly falling short of. His motivation made complete sense. And not only did it make sense, it was also effectively communicated to the audience within the first 10 minutes of the film. We are now almost double that time into the first episode of The Nine Realms, and I still don't know why Tom is doing the things that he's doing. He's just really, really curious, and that's why. <clears throat> Even worse, it doesn't make sense for everyone to be shitting on Tom the way that they are. 
In How to Train Your Dragon 1, everyone hated Hiccup because even though he had good intentions, he was constantly fucking up their defenses of the island. Tom literally saved someone's life in the first 10 minutes and they still treat him like shit. How could they have done this better? I'm glad you fucking asked! It's been shown that Tom's mother is essentially the most important person on the project, even to the point that the Fisher is named after her. How about instead of Tom being shoehorned away from the project 20 seconds after they get there, his mother convinces the other scientists that he could actually be of use in some small way. He's given an opportunity for exploration of the Fisher and a certain responsibility is placed on him. In the middle of this, he gets distracted by that flying creature he keeps seeing and fucks up the mission somehow, like destroying one of their expensive drones or putting someone's life in danger. Because of this, he proves to his mother and the other adults that he isn't ready or mature enough to handle these responsibilities, and then he's told to stay the fuck out of their business. Therefore, giving him a personal drive to prove himself by discovering what this mysterious creature is and leading to the discovery of it. Then he continuously faces a mirrored moral dilemma that movie one Hiccup faced. If he were to show the adults his discovery, it would mean that he'd regain the respect they lost for him, but it would also put the dragon in grave danger. So he selflessly keeps it a secret as long as he can, despite having to deal with everyone on the project wrongfully looking down on him. It literally took me two minutes to come up with that very plausible narrative. You guys are actually getting paid to do this and you're failing at everything! How the fuck is this the same guy who wrote Have Dragon Will Travel Part 2, Midnight Scrum, Night of the Hunters Part 1, Mia Morwing? The man who created the Nine Realms is also responsible for giving us the scrap metal meme and Astrid canonically shaking her tits at Hiccup, which actually made Dragon's history by the episode getting restricted for adult content on Netflix Kids. Okay, that may have also had to do with Dagger and Mala straight up exercising their pain fetish in a show rated Y7. Hit me again. Oh, no, no. Go on. Dagger. Hit me again. Okay. This is probably a bad idea. Yeah, no shit. A few moments later. Please die, please die, please die, please die, please die, please die. Oh, fuck. What the fuck? Is that a fucking cat? Go away! Go on! Get out of here! Ma! Ma, there's a weird fucking straight cat outside! The suspense. Episode 2 is titled First Flight Part 2, and well, please die, please die, please die, please die, please die. Fuck! Nothing has changed. Okay, I think it's time I completely tear apart the dragon's designs, starting with the nightlight. I've heard it argued again and again whether or not this dragon is one of Toothless's children or a very distant descendant, and it makes me laugh every time because DreamWorks has already confirmed that he's a descendant. Either way, this isn't the thing that I'm angry about. It's the fact that they would model him to look so absolutely stupid. While it's never been outright said, I sort of assume that the only reason the nightlights in the hidden world were modeled to be a mix of both black and white instead of either or was so the theater audiences could see them and go, aww, they look like kittens. And yes, as babies, their designs are very adorable, but I truly believe that if Dean ever imagined that the nightlights would someday be used as the protagonist's epic dragon companion in another action-based show, they would definitely have been either all black or all white. Reason being, as adults, they look fucking stupid. There is nothing cool or badass about him like there was Toothless. And even if you were going for cuteness, just being a solid color, Toothless is still the cutest dragon of them all. They even say it. Toothless, uh, come on. He's the cutest, obviously. Like a little puppy. Red tea. Yeah, you feel me? What about Barf and Belch? Now, this isn't something that's really the show's fault, given that they were working with material from the movie, but why does he still look so weird? Also, it makes absolutely no sense why the Nightlight's attack would have evolved to producing solely electric current. Because, spoiler alert, that's its new power, apparently. Instead of plasma blasts, it projects electrical currents which can fuck up electricity-based technology in the area. And this is obviously derivative of the fact that in the hidden world, Toothless discovered that he could manipulate lightning from stormy clouds. But it makes no sense that his descendants would evolve to be able to do only this. Because I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but in order to do that, you kind of need, oh, I don't know, storms? Clouds? Something you would not have access to if your family line had been living underground for 1300 years. What the f Fuck. Where did you come from? Why am I asking questions? Yeah, great dialogue there. Then we get a sort of bonding scene between Tom and Thunder because yeah, I forgot to mention, he names the dragon Thunder too. So creative. What's worse is they even point out how boring this name is in the show. I thought I'd call him Thunder. 
Cause lightning's too on the nose. And yeah, this bonding scene is kinda cute, but mostly just because it reminds me of Hiccup and Toothless. Maybe if all the things I'd been talking about for the past editing Audrey input, how long this shit's taken me to explain, had been done better, then I'd enjoy it more authentically. But everything was done poorly, so thanks. I hate it. Mom, <gasps> it's not what it looks like. I found him running around near the fissure. Okay, it's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> Okay, so you got home in the middle of the night and your son was missing, so you just hung out? I can see where he gets his ineptitude. From this moment forward, when you are not in school, you will be here. What school? They don't go to school once in this whole season! I am totally chill. Don't I look chill? Why don't you talk? Kind of funny how the one character I enjoy the most is the one that never says anything. Reflective of the dialogue, wouldn't you say? Yes, I saw something. A moth. A moth? Girl, you need to get your freaky ass eyes checked if you think- mm -mm. If dragons were real, humanity would exterminate them. Big business would exploit them, reducing them to a tiny column of profit margins on an endless spreadsheet of doom. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what this show perceives as subtle social commentary. It would be one thing if they were trying to play back into Hiccup's monologue at the end of movie 3 where he talks about the world not being ready for the existence of dragons, but isn't a dragon-based show taking place in modern times the perfect example of why this wouldn't work ever? Call me cynical, but I don't think present day Earth is what you would consider to be everyone getting along. Chances are they're gonna go further in depth with this concept in later seasons, but it's just another reason why this show's existence makes absolutely no sense. Okay, got the food. Okay, you may have noticed that I'm being extremely forgiving about shit like Tom being able to fit an ungodly amount of large objects into his bag. But again, I'm not gonna knock the Nine Realms on something that the other shows were very much guilty of as well. So much so that it even became a punchline in Race to the Edge Season 6. Some would call him a wizard. How does he always have a terrible terror, or a new tail, or the dragon blade that just seems to magically appear out of nowhere? I mean, there it is, suddenly. But don't worry, I don't need to pick apart material stuff like that when one of the worst scenes in this entire first season is about to take place. Tom brings Thunder a bunch of food options to see what he likes and therefore ends up bonding further with him. Also known as the forbidden friendship replication. Even using the term replication feels wrong because it implies that viewers of this new show would feel even somewhat similar to how viewers of movie one felt during that scene. And obviously that is not true in the slightest. It was as if they had a fucking board meeting and said, all right, let's recreate one of the most memorable and touching scenes from the first movie, but make everything much worse. And I'm not just talking about the narrative beats, even the animation sucks balls. Mm. Guess you're not a fan of spaghetti. Mouth. Damn. Here we reach one of the first of many scenes just like this. You'll notice it going forward, but every time the Nine Realms needs a scene where it feels authentic or emotional, they just copy and paste a scene from the original franchise here in this new season. Except, again, they did everything much worse, so it isn't technically copy-paste, it's more like they copied it, and when they went to paste, the web page froze, and then they got impatient because they don't know how technology works, so they just kept pressing Control v And when it finally loaded, they were left with a big scrambled mess. And they tried to fix it, but the damage was done and it still looks like garbage, so they, they just left it the way it was. That's pretty much the best way I can describe all of the homages of the original franchise here. Like, look at this scene. This is supposed to be the big first flight scene. It's the scene we've been building to for two episodes now. The name of the goddamn episodes are First Flight Part 1 and 2. But everything about this first flight scene doesn't work. Not only does the animation look like shit, but the cinematography is so boring. There's nothing cool about the dragon carrying him like this. Just like there's nothing cool about the scenery. In How to Train Your Dragon 1, the scenery was the thing they tried to concentrate on most when making the flight sequences. Yes, they had a much larger budget working for them, but even in shows like Riders and Defenders, where the budget couldn't have been much better than The Nine Realms, things still looked interesting. I'll go more into detail about this point in the next episode because they do something very similar where they rip off not only my favorite scene in the entire How to Train Your Dragon franchise, but my favorite visual sequence in any movie in existence. And just when you thought this scene couldn't get any worse, they have the audacity to do this. Seriously? Was there nobody at DreamWorks who tapped the writers on the shoulder and was like, hey, 
Maybe we shouldn't try to replicate the climactic scene from the first movie. Not only is it extremely lazy and proves that we have no new ideas, but it's also the scene where Hiccup loses a literal body part and almost dies. But no, they did it anyway. And of course, it looks awful. But wait! There's more! I know, how is the episode not over yet? Then Thunder brings him to the entrance to the hidden world. You know, the thing the whole third movie was about and built up to until it was essentially the big cathartic moment Hiccup had been hoping for to bring peace to among dragons. What's extra funny about this shot is literally all the dragons are terrible terrors. Mind you, the only dragon species from the original franchise that we even see in the show besides the nightlight. Look, Race to the Edge had its drawbacks, all right? I think I've made that clear even in the times I've praised it so far. But what Race to the Edge absolutely never did was make a huge climactic moment cheap. They put work into it. They put money into it. And if Race to the Edge was handling this exact same scene, it would look so much better. And for the grand two-part finale, we are going to hold on this army of terrible terrors flying nowhere. Super cool. Episode 3 starts and has probably the worst name I've ever seen in a children's show. A whole new world. Whole, spelled H-O-L-E. Why wouldn't they just spell whole correctly and make it an obvious derivative of the Aladdin song? I mean, hell, Romantic Flight gets flack all the time because people conflate it with a whole new world sequence, and this episode contains the Nine Realms' terrible replication of it. Don't worry, we'll get there. Maybe it had to do with Disney being a corporate asshole and there's no way it would be allowed. But it's not like DreamWorks has any room to talk. I swear to God, if Universal claims this very fair use video, it will be a whole new added punchline. Oh, sorry, whole new. Also, speaking of titles, what the hell's with these? First Flight, A Whole New World. Hey, here's a creative one. Dragon Club. And the last two are literally just named after dragons we see in them. Sure, the other shows had the occasional generic title, but most of them were blatant pop culture references relating to stuff that happened in the particular episode. You want to talk about naming it after a song? Smoke Gets in Your Eyes, Bad Moon Rising, We Are Family, Living on the Edge, Buffalord Soldier, Relating to the Buffalord Dragon. You could theoretically say a whole new world is using the same formula, but really, DreamWorks? It sounds like the name of an Aladdin porn parody. I don't think it's on a magic card Smash. Anyway, you'll see that from here to Featherhide, the episodes focus on each one of the remaining kids. Because, spoiler alert, the kids find out that there are dragons, and they get their own dragons. Who could have guessed it? A whole new world focuses on June in particular. I'll spare you the boring as fuck first five minutes and skip to the equally boring plot that I have to recite so this video has consistency. This astronomer nerd freak of fucking animation follows Tom into the forest where she forces him to show her his dragon. Okay, that sounded way better in my head. One of the things that really bugs me about these sequences of the other kids discovering dragons is that none of them are really all that impressed. A real dragon. Like, yeah, they might scream or act freaked out for the first 30 seconds, but they sure as hell don't act like they just discovered a mythological beast of legend and that they're one of the only people on Earth to know about it. Hell, Astrid acted more shocked in the first movie when she met Toothless than June did when she met Thunder, and that was when everyone knew dragons existed. June! June! It's safe! Oh my god. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen, the romantic flight replication. You might be asking as a blanket statement, does this scene really work in the context of the show? And to that, I would say, if you were someone who didn't watch the original franchise at all and went into the Nine Realms thinking it was all original, this might be one of the best scenes for you. But the problem is, nobody who watched the show had not already seen the original. That's the only reason it was greenlit in the first place, we all know it. And the only reason someone with no knowledge of the original franchise would think this scene is good is because the source material scene is filmmaking perfection. Romantic Flight is not only my favorite scene in the entire How to Train Your Dragon franchise, but it is also one of my favorite scenes in any movie in existence. I was 10 years old when I saw How to Train Your Dragon 1 in theaters, and I vividly remember my jaw dropping at this shot. And it's not just because I would pull a Captain Smith from Titanic and sacrifice my whole existence before a band abandoning the Hickstrid ship, there are a million reasons why this scene works so well. John Powell's score is so authentically visceral and euphoric. 
The cinematography is flawless and there are many factors that play into this. Chris Sanders mentioned that during these emotional flight sequences, it's the production team's goal to rarely, if ever, show the ground. And it's because they want you sucked into the world that Hiccup has discovered since Finding Toothless. A whole new world. God damn it, they got me too. This concept, once again, poorly copied and pasted into the Nine Realms does not work at all. This crack in the ground isn't nice to look at. The hidden world looks like shit. It looked amazing in How to Train Your Dragon 3 because they had half a billion dollar budget and a lot of talented people working on it. This show has neither of those things. And for those of you screaming, stop picking on the Nine Realms. It's not their fault they were working with no budget. Let me share some wisdom with you. Not only was nobody asking for another How to Train Your Dragon series after the franchise ended, let alone one taking place in modern day, but also things like budgets matter in animated shows. If they were really working with so little money and creative people that everything ends up looking like shit, then that product should have never been made in the first place. Or it should have been altered in a way to where they could compensate for the lack of budget by transforming the work to meet their needs while still retaining the quality they were going for. Why did the show have to be in 3D? Why couldn't they just make one in a 2D style and because they'd have more money by doing that, they use it to make a compelling story? Do I think this show could have been better as a 2D animation? Probably. Not only could they have spent more money on talented writers and animators to make this work, but they also could have afforded to make more episodes. This has proven to not only work, but be very successful with other animation properties. Just because everything else in the franchise was made in 3D doesn't mean you're stuck doing it. Besides, if there was ever a time to change production style in the How to Train Your Dragon universe, it would be after a 1300 year time jump where you have essentially no ties to the original story. Because I'd be more inclined to enjoy the scene if everything didn't look like complete ass. Oh look, there's some lava falling. We got some beautiful gray rock. Hold up everybody, this is the most spectacular part. You ready? Steam. I will never have the fucking capacity to understand why they made this character's eyes purple. She already looks so plasticky and cartoonish next to Tom and it adds another layer of ridiculousness that I promise you this show did not need. <laughs> What is it, pal? Stop calling him pal! I know you just wanted to put a twist on your attempt to copy how Hiccup always called Toothless Bud, but it's so fucking obvious. Again, something Race to the Edge was self-aware of. Oh, bud! Fly, bud! Do something, bud! Da -da -da, okay. Hey, look! There was grass in Race to the Edge. Okay, I take back every compliment I gave the Nine Realms. So, because June lacks basic human intelligence, she walks up to a dragon the size of a bus and is surprised when she gets chased. All of it results in her falling into a hole and discovering the Mist Twister dragon. Which, like I stated earlier, is a dragon that I found interesting. I enjoyed the practicality of its attack, but why the fuck does it look so stupid? It's obvious they were trying to pull inspiration from Asian historical depictions of dragons, because the writer is Asian, so I guess that's how it works, but placing it in the How to Train Your Dragon universe, it looks so dumb. Look at its fucking face. Actually, you know what? It fits in great with the Nine Realms, because its character design is just as shitty as everything else, so I don't know why I even bothered. I've been waiting to bring this point up, even though I've been noticing it since episode one, but oh my god, is the lip synchronization to the voice actor's audio fucking terrible. You're the most beautiful creature I've ever seen. But stop almost crushing me! So the conceit of the plot is June is trapped in this cavern with the Mist Twister dragon and has to train it to get out while Tom and Thunder fend off a group of gem breaker dragons. I didn't just read your chart, Tom. I read my own and I think this is my destiny. Shut up about the fucking Zodiac charts already. Why do they treat this as a serious plot point? Sure, you can make it part of her personality, but there are ways to do that where it isn't so annoying. If this show ever showed an ounce of self-awareness, I'd feel compelled to give it points, but it never does, so fuck it. All right, well, boring stuff happens and she escapes the cavern. <laughs> really? You didn't think to do that before fuck do I even bother? Also, can I just bring up how stupid it is that they have June riding a two-headed dragon by herself? Like, there's no situation where that isn't awkward looking. It worked for Rough Nut and Tough Nut because there were two of them and a two-headed dragon. Hell, they even made up this rule that you cannot physically ride the dragon unless there are two riders. Whoa, 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 wait. We need two riders. How am I gonna fly Barf and Belch without you? Not a rule I'm gonna carry over to the Nine Realms because, again, they were not consistent with it in the original shows either. But I can't help 
but feel that they included that as a rule in the first place to not only incite narrative conflict, but to also make it so that there's always two people riding barf and belts so that it doesn't look so fucking awkward. So, what's its, I mean, their names? Wu and Wei. Whoa! <laughs> the dragon's names are Wu and Wei, and I'm actually not mad at that. They're probably the most creative of the bunch, so good job. You tried one out of four times. I'm proud of you. Episode 4 is titled Dragon Club and focuses on D'Angelo bonding with a gym breaker dragon. Yeah, those big awkward looking things from before, well, D'Angelo's gonna train one. Tom and June escape from the hidden world after finding that one of the dragons has an injury that they can't see or identify and every time they get close to the dragon, it fires at them. So what do they decide to do? Oh, just go get a simple first aid kit, of course. You know, a first aid kit meant for humans. Probably has a couple band-aids and some Neosporin. Dragon approved! Sounds like... Icarus Strong. You'd think there would be a lot more of those! For the hundredth time! What are you assholes even up here doing?! Yeah, but they invested a billion dollars into this corporation. A billion dollars for what?! So you idiots can fuck around and lose equipment? Perhaps operator error? Wait, what? Who's an operator? It's all automatic. I just push the buttons people tell me to push. Oh, so you hire people who don't know what they're doing and only go about business as they're told just so they can make you money without any regard for doing that in a way that'll yield the best results? Kinda like Ready guys? Line delivery of the century here. There's some bizarre electro and geomagnetic anomalies happening. What is that? What it is? Oh, what's up? What's up? Got your nigga in the cup. God damn. We really need or some herbal candles, or better yet, healing crystals. Congrats, June. Joey Graceffo would be proud. So because D'Angelo knows a little about veterinary work, June convinces Tom to let him meet the dragons. Okay, so listen up. The first rule of Dragon Club is you don't talk about Dragon Club. Really? If this was even intended to be a pop culture reference, first off, I'm impressed. Because there have been none of those at all in this show, and there will continue to not be any. Those were pretty much the highlight of the other shows, admittedly because they took place in Viking Age, but also because the writers never took themselves too seriously when it came to that type of humor. They're oh, no! They're all gonna laugh at me! Ugh. Oh, God. This is my rifle! There are many like it, but this one is mine. Okay, repeat after me. This is my dragon. There are many like it, but this one is mine. I've had it with these motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking plane. I am so sick of these freaking eels and this freaking mate. Stop it! And this very obvious Fight Club reference would actually be something I'd applaud the show for, except Defenders of Burke already fucking did it! And I don't just mean they made the joke, I mean they literally dedicated a whole episode to it. Nobody can know. As far as you're concerned, it doesn't exist. There is no Dragon Flight Club. Oh boy, another scene of a kid being introduced to mythological creatures of legend and having basically no reaction. <laughs> Alright, fine, I take that back. He's passed out, not dead. Thunder... <laughs> Give him a little juice. <laughs> Stop right fucking there! Not only would this dragon, who as of three days ago had no idea humans even existed, be able to properly disperse the right amount of electricity to wake him instead of frying him like a fucking egg, but also, it's been three days! And somehow these dragons can understand English language and commands like absolutely nothing. Oh, and how are you gonna stop me? We could just leave you down here. Do I even need to commentate at this point? There is no style in the camera work at all. 75% of the time, we're just watching scenes play out from one camera angle directly in front of the characters. Nothing about it is interesting or engaging. You know that even if characters are having a conversation about something boring, dynamic camera work and interesting cinematography can still make the shot engaging enough to keep viewers invested. This is really very basic stuff that literally everyone who's seen a television show before can pick up on. Okay, fine. The first thing we have to do is triage. Figure out exactly what's wrong. I don't even think triage is the right word for that. Triage means assessing the most critical patients in a mass injury situation. Do you even care, or did you just assume all the kids watching this were too dumb to notice? I think I have another plan. A tranquilizer? I'm sorry, what the fuck is a tranquilizer gun doing in a first aid kit? Oh, okay, it all makes sense now. So instead of exploring the fissure in this billion dollar project, the adults have been jerking off and getting high off horse tranquilizer. That actually explains a lot. Aha, I think we found the problem. 
Hold still now. Uh, got it. Ah, a real Viking for hire moment you have there. Why the fuck not? You're ripping off everything else. I mean, the whole conceit of this episode can pretty much be attributed to the next big sting. But maybe I'm just being pessimistic. Ice him up! <laughs> The fuck did that even do? It looked so shit. Catch me. <laughs> All right. Anyway, the rest of the action is really boring. Plowhorn. Her name is Plowhorn. Well, I can think of worse. Thunder! All right, this episode was definitely my least favorite of the six. Not because it made me angry, but because it didn't make me feel anything. I was so fucking bored watching this. At least when I'm angry, I'm feeling some type of emotion. This was so bad. But hey, look what's next. Episode 5 is titled Featherhide, and as I stated before, it is my favorite episode of the first season. Now, bear in mind, it is not a good episode. There are no good episodes in the Nine Realms. There are only episodes that are not as bad as other episodes, and this was one of them. The episode starts with Alex being an introverted mess, and her mother's wishing she would just have one friend in her fucking lifetime, also known as my life minus the mother's. I, I don't have any of those. So like a real pro stalker, she decides to go tracking Tom down via a GPS that she has on him. Really weird, now that I say that out loud. Okay, pal. Time for the old boom boom goodbye trick. Look, I appreciate the effort to rename your attack mechanism so you aren't blatantly copying the original franchise, but you seriously couldn't think of a better command than boom boom goodbye? Plasma Blast was cool. Spine Shot was cool. Lava Blast was cool. Oh, but here we have boom and whoosh and loogie bomb. Great. If I can say anything, this episode contained the first moment in four episodes where I actually laughed when I was supposed to. Ah! Um, huh? Okay then. That's funny. Of course, it's immediately ruined by the other less interesting characters, but it was funny. So then we're introduced to the Featherhide Dragon, which, like I stated before, has the same camouflaging ability as the Changewing Dragon, while also being able to mimic noises it hears. Obviously, this becomes an issue when it and the other dragons follow the kids back to their homes in the center of the project, and they have to carefully figure out a way to get them back underground without the adults seeing. And this episode is actually my favorite for this scene in particular, which is also responsible for Alex being my favorite character. She sits down with Tom and explains why she's so afraid to go outside and be trusting of others, especially animals. This one time, this really big dog followed me home and everyone was saying, it likes you, it likes you, you should pet it. And so I did pet it and it bit me. It bit me so hard. So now I don't go outside and Nothing ever follows me home. I don't listen to people when they tell me it's safe outside because it is not safe outside. No, not always, but sometimes it's amazing and fantastic and, and worth taking a risk for. This is good writing. Instead of just giving her a quirky hobby or making her uptight for no reason, they actually gave her a compelling story. You could even say this makes for character development because Tom can now show her that not all creatures are out to hurt her and thus gives her a motivation to bond with the Featherhide. This is my favorite scene in the whole show, which means we can only go downhill from here. Everyone strap in, because the rest of the episode is really dumb. The dragons and kids have to use their hiding maneuvers to try to make it back to the fissure, and... Come on out! I know you're there! I will find you. Are you fucking kidding me? Hey, hey Twitter mob, no need to cancel this show because it doesn't represent the blind community. After this scene, I'm convinced there's no way D'Angelo's dad is not sight impaired. Oh hey, that reminds me, pausing my commentary on the episode for a moment. Around the latter part of December, I started getting random blind spots in my right eye that wouldn't go away and they progressively got worse and worse to the point where now around 30% of my total vision is just gone. After seeing an ophthalmologist twice, he literally doesn't know what's happening, but it's possible I have a detached retina. And it all started when I first 
just watched the Nine Realms for this video, so I can officially say that the Nine Realms looks so bad, it actually made me go blind. Congratulations, DreamWorks. There's my official quote. Put that on the fucking Peacock banner, why don't you? Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, these adults are incompetent. I'm gonna call you Feathers because of your beautiful plumage. Another boring name? Seriously? There are so many cool names you could have given this thing. How about Copycat? Like D'Angelo called it earlier. You're really just gonna call a dragon who's already known as a feather hide feathers? Anyways, great news everyone! We're nearly done with this piece of shit first season! And if you've stuck around solely for the purpose of listening to me make fun of this series, the last episode will not disappoint. Episode 6 is titled Fault River and is the season finale of The Nine Realms. And the stupidity just keeps on giving. It's like the series suddenly realized they haven't included any antagonist at all in the episodes that they've already premiered, so they just threw in this horribly rendered Goliath dragon to compensate. Actually, this episode includes two new antagonists. Now, the reason I haven't picked apart the fact that this show has no real villains so far is because season 1 of The Nine Realms took a very similar approach to the first movie, where there isn't exactly a human antagonist aside aside from the other Burkeans being a threat if they found out about Toothless, and ending with a face-off with a giant red death. In the Nine Realms, the kids have to work to keep the dragons a secret from their parents and ultimately face off against the Fault Ripper dragon, who's been alluded to a small number of times so far in the series and is discovered to be responsible for repeated earthquakes, which is the catalyst for the conflict of this episode. And another quake could fracture the wall, dropping Icarus and Raketown into the chasm. We send a manned probe a couple miles into the fissure, near the endpoint of the last quake. Then we deploy explosives to blast that spot, and I believe that will stop whatever is creating these tremors. Okay, I am not educated or remotely knowledgeable enough to deem anything she just said as bullshit or not, but at face value it sounds like bullshit. Earthquakes are the result of tectonic plates colliding beneath the Earth's surface. Yes, they aren't aware that this is actually a dragon causing it, but it still doesn't make any sense why blowing up the foundation beneath your project would make things any safer. Then again, these are the same people that keep horse tranquilizer in their first aid kits. They said it, corporate. Olivia's planning on detonating the fissure. Holy shit, do these bitches know how to make a cringy-ass entrance. I don't know why these two henchwomen are beside her. This is literally the only shot that they're seen in. And they're the exact same model, too. They look like a shitty girl band about to perform a bad X Factor audition. Okay, so Dr... What the fuck was her name? Slutkin. I legit had to turn on captions. Is the new antagonist, I suppose. My guess is she'll be more important in later seasons, but who the fuck knows at this point. She has beef with Tom's mother and works for the big bad corporation. And she has this haircut, so yeah. Definitely a villain. So the kids decide to send their dragons back to the hidden world so they'll stay safe from any damage the explosion will cause. Then they see this. <laughs> Holy fuck. Maybe spending all that budget on an army of terrible terrors and blades of grass was a mistake. Hey, remember how they sent their dragons to the hidden world? Well, yeah, they changed their minds. I am not kidding. It is less than one minute later they decide to go back for them. Can't believe we just said goodbye to our dragons. But we're gonna need our dragons. So how were they gonna do this? Oh, you know, just steal this multi-million dollar pod that's located at the center of the project and descend a mile into the trench with absolutely no plan or idea how they're gonna hide it from their parents. <laughs> how else were you expecting? Keep in mind this motherfucker has been dancing since day one and none of their surveillance equipment has picked it up. Incompetent! What are you even here to do? D, use the crane to swing the probe. <laughs> oh, I've seen this before. If only we got to see these two land in a pit of lava and get cooked alive, but we are not so lucky. Hey, why isn't the probe secure? Okay, so these adults came outside, saw that the probe was a mile into the fissure, and didn't think it was a cause for concern? Maybe you all deserve to be sucked under the Earth's crust as a result of an earthquake. Tom, look out! Why are you yelling? Didn't we just establish that this dragon is blind but specifically uses hearing to locate its prey? Look at the size of those ear holes. Must haunt my sound. Bring it up! Bring it up! No go! It's stuck on something! You literally had one job, my guy. Everything's totally fine for no reason besides plot. Then we get the fight sequence. You know, 
the fight sequence between Thunder and the Fault Ripper Dragon? Do I even need to talk about why this looks so bad? This is the climax of the whole season, the thing we've been building up to, and it looks like plastic figurines in a nine-year-old's YouTube video. I know I sound like a broken record, but cinematography, editing, and choreography especially in a fight scene, matters. Let's look at yet another example from Race to the Edge. To make things fair, I chose a fight sequence that took place in a similar setting as the climax of the Nine Realms. I'm gonna try to convey this clip the best I can without getting claimed by Universal, which means I'm gonna be editing it down a little bit, but it's from Race to the Edge, Season 1, Episode 10, Have Dragon Will Travel, Part 1. If you don't feel like going all the way to Netflix, the clip is on YouTube. Pay attention to the camera work, the pacing, the editing, the lighting, everything in this next clip. <laughs> one minute section, there is so much going for it. Hiccup isn't just passively chasing wind shear, there is real consequence on their surroundings. They manipulate the environment to gain competitive advantages. They use their environment in creative ways specific to the dragon's abilities. We're constantly given POV shots to heighten the chaos. And look at the rock formations they're flying in. You can see just how fast these dragons are moving, how dangerous one slip up can be. And even in the character's choreography and blocking, Toothless doesn't just shoot wind shear down, he fires a plasma blast at a rock wall that bounces and hits Windshear in her blind spot. This is a high energy fight sequence. It gets your adrenaline pumping. And that's only one minute out of the whole episode. And it's done better than anything so far in the entire first season of the Nine Realms. Speaking of... Oh, that's it? He just ducked out of the way and he's fine? Great. So interesting. Oh, hey, look, the other writers are here. I bet it's about to get really cool. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. <clears throat> hmm. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Oh, look, all we have to do is sensory overload it with noise, and that's its weakness. Hooray! What the fuck do you want me to say at this point? It's bad. It's really bad. This is the most anticlimactic climax I've ever seen in my life. Please die, please die, please die, please die, please die. Yes! Fucking finally! Oh, but he isn't dead. I know all of you thought they'd kill off the main character at the end of the first season, but nope. He's still alive. Thank fucking God. Ow! That's for scaring me to death. Don't you fucking do it. But what about everything else? Ah! No! So, that fucking pause after he delivered the line, too. What about everything else? So, it's like they literally anticipated Hickstrid shippers to start screaming. Well, I screamed all right! Fuck you, the fall fuck, ripper you, dragon. fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, So, what happened to the Fall Ripper Dragon? I don't know, but I hope he's okay. Really? You hope it's okay? That'd be like Hiccup waking up after defeating the Red Death, seeing that his leg had been hacked off, and immediately going, But was the big dragon I fought okay? I'm fine. Just a, a little groggy. Yeah, too much horse tranquilizer will do that to you, Mom. Okay, ignoring the absolutely ridiculous fact that Thunder even had the capability to make this symbol, I now have to address the big final point of the show that I've been saving until the very end of my analysis. And it was one that I called in my trailer reaction. Yes, everyone, 
This e-boy is a descendant of Hiccup Horrendous Haddock III. Is this ever outwardly said no? But because even though the creators at DreamWorks dropped the ball on every single aspect of this show imaginable, they still felt the need to flex by giving fans a little canonical easter egg. The easter egg being Tom's name itself. After exploring the Nine Realms wiki, I stumbled upon this little fact, which is that the name Colerson is composed of the word color, which is Danish for Haddock, and Sen, which means son of. Tom, son of Haddock. Regardless of this, many have argued that Tom bears a lot of visual similarities to Hiccup. Even my dad, who, after painstakingly listening to me rant on about this for way too long, was like, yeah, I saw the trailer for it on Hulu's homepage and thought he looked like Hiccup, which even in and of itself shouldn't make any sense. Do you have any idea how many ancestors have to be after Hiccup in a 1300 year time span? I legit did research on this because I thought it was so stupid and basically, yeah, it would be virtually impossible for a person to bear any facial similarities to an ancestor from over a thousand years ago, unless there was a crazy amount of inbreeding going on. Maybe they should have hired heathen vampires to write this new show. Anyway, I've pretty much accepted this fact because I knew from the day the trailer dropped there was no way it wasn't going to happen. And I have to say that even though I think it's cheap and disingenuous, if this means we'll get to learn any additional lore about the Haddock family in future seasons, that's actually something I'm looking forward to. Assuming they don't completely fuck it up, which gives given everything I've said so far about this season is a very high probability. But if you're going to mercilessly profit off the original franchise, you may as well give fans something of substance, as long as you don't completely blow it, which you probably will. <laughs> We did it guys. We made it through the first season of the Nine Realms. Was it as bad as I thought it was going to be? Hell yes. Do I wish it never happened in the first place? Hell yes. But if this show has proven anything to me, it actually has more to do in relation with the original franchise than anything new. And it's that even though I think the original movies and shows are amazing, I have to admit that the overall production scenario was pretty much a perfect storm. I've always been a Dragons fan who holds the opinion that the shows are actually better than the films, specifically Race to the Edge. No, they don't have the huge budget or cinematic charms of the movies, but what they do have is time. The side characters in the movies are no longer side characters, they're main characters. Because of this, we're able to connect with them on a more intimate level, just like we are the main characters in the movies. And there's tons of room to explore what these main characters' reactions would be in scenarios that we just don't have time to show in the films. But the real question is, would Race to the Edge hold up as a show on its own if the films did not exist? And even though it's hard for me to admit, I'd say that the answer is probably no. Even though I think the animation works great in a sideshow to a DreamWorks trilogy, I also think I'd be way less likely to tolerate it if I had not seen what the Dragon's World looked like through the lens of a big screen blockbuster. I am in no way trying to imply that the Nine Realms should have had a film to precede itself. I'm trying to make it abundantly clear that the Hatter Train Your Dragon franchise should have stayed finished. Except for the Fire Tides. There's still hope! <laughs> okay, for those who don't know, the Fire Tides was supposed to be the third Dark Horse comic released to bridge the gap between movie two and three, but was ultimately scrapped and never released. It was supposed to include a cool submarine dragon, more bonding moments between the characters, but most importantly, the first and only canon depiction of shirtless hiccup in the entire franchise. Richard Hamilton urged fans to tweet at Dark Horse to get the release approved, but it never succeeded. It's not too late. At Dark Horse, hashtag release the fire tides. I will continue this until the day I die. Anyways. My point is the How to Train Your Dragon shows had everything going for them. A loyal audience who were eager to learn more about dragon lore in the world of the barbaric archipelago, talented showrunners, sufficient budgets. We come back to the same question we've been asking since the beginning. Why does the Nine Realms exist? I mean, I know why. It was to cash in because How to Train Your Dragon was DreamWorks' last accredited franchise to end and they don't know what the fuck to do without it. But why? Why would you do that? It's such a slap in the face to the original narrative and everyone who worked to make it happen. Will I continue to watch and or review the show if more seasons are released? Sure. I'm too fucking invested at this point. You know how many hours I had to sit here looking at these kids' faces while making this video? And I'm not a complete pessimistic asshole. I hope the quality does improve. I don't think it will, nor will I even remotely get my hopes up for the possibility of future Haddock family lore. But as a certified Dragonite, I have an obligation now. And that is to be the voice of the OG Dragon fans, and we're all saying the exact same thing. 
fucking stop! And that's gonna be it for my review of Dragons the Nine Realms. I know I had a ton of people looking forward to this video, so hopefully it was everything you were wanting. If you disagree with my opinion, that's fine. Tell me what you thought of the show in the comments. I'm pretty sure this is gonna be my longest video on the channel. I would like to take the end of this video and address some of the comments that were left on my trailer review. I would just do it in the comments feature, but I'm really awkward about doing that. I want to respond to people right when they comment, but at the same time, if for some reason the video does really well and I get a ton of comments, then I don't want people to think that I'm purposefully ignoring their comments and only responding to certain others. So in my head, the solution is just to not respond to any of them at all. I'm a mess, guys. I'm just wondering if anyone has read the book series the movies are based on because they are so different, it's actually funny. I love that you bring this up because while I'm a diehard movie fan, I've actually only read the first book. The reason being, I saw the movie before I even knew there were books, and because I loved the movie so much, I read the first book and was put off by how different it was. So for future reference, I am a How to Train Your Dragon movie expert, not a book expert. This person's basically asking what people found wrong with the Hidden Worlds ending, which is something I briefly touched on in my trailer review. For me, anyways, it wasn't so much the ending itself, and more so how we got there. It's kind of a general consensus in the fandom that the only reason the plot for the Hidden World works at all is because Toothless was just really, really horny. I was all for the movies ending the same way the books did, even though they basically had nothing to do with each other. I just think the overall execution could have been done better. You should watch it before hating on something you haven't seen. Well, I saw it and I hated it, but thanks anyways. DreamWorks can't seem to make anything original anymore. I mean, I agree, but isn't Disney guilty of it too? How many awful remakes have they made just in the past few years? And besides, do we really want any more modern day DreamWorks originals? Look at what they've made recently. We don't need more of these. Not gonna lie, this is Sonic's first design all over again. At least with Sonic, they listened to the criticism and actually fixed it. This is just a nightmare. This person is just basically saying that we need to chill out because of course DreamWorks is just a money hungry company. Company, and there's really nothing we can do to stop it. Pretty much everything they say here is true. I've accepted that DreamWorks is just doing this for money, but I think that if enough fans voice their displeasure, someone is bound to take notice and either prevent future things like this from happening or push them to make it better so that way it's not such bad quality, which is a huge reason I made this video to begin with. How do you rank the trilogy? I get asked this question a lot as a Dragons fan, and my answer has always been, I love all three movies equally, just for different reasons. Like the first one I obviously love because of nostalgia purposes. A lot of people would argue that it has the most authentic story and it certainly defied a lot of people's expectations at the time. And I love the second movie because it felt like the perfect next step in Hiccup's journey. It was darker, more mature, grittier. And the third movie I would say is probably the weakest plot wise, which is what a lot of critics were saying at the time of its release and I definitely understand where they're coming from. I hate Grimmel as a villain. I hate him. And not in a fun villain hating sort of way. I mean, he is my least favorite villain in the entire franchise. I cringe every time he's on screen. I really wish they would have just kept Drago the villain of the third movie, which is what they were originally planning. That and the whole horny toothless motivation really brought it down for me. But we were finally gifted the decade long awaited Hickstrid wedding and subsequent Hickstrid babies. So to me, that's the perfect ending. And I would argue that it's one of the most technologically advanced animated films in existence. Aw shit, here we, we go again. again. That's the perfect meme to describe the Nine Realms. This person is pointing out that I got Legend of the Bone Napper Dragon and Book of Dragons confused in my chronological analysis in my trailer review. Thank you for bringing that up. I think the reason I got the two confused is because not only were they released simultaneously, I'm pretty sure, but also I heavily debated even including Book of Dragons in my chronological analysis because even though it uses things that are referenced later in the franchise like Bork's Papers, it's also a short where the main characters literally break the fourth wall, which I don't think would be considered canon, but regardless, yes, Legend of the Bone Napper Dragon comes before Book of Dragons. Does anyone remember that awful rise of the brave tangled frozen dragons? The kid in the Nine Realms looks like a Jack Frost and Elsa OC child. Okay, that's so fucking accurate. Listen, I try to never shame people for crossover ships or whatever, but what the actual fuck was Rise of the Brave Tangled Frozen Dragons and how did it get so popular? I mean, thousands of fan art and fan fiction pieces aside, there were literal conventions where these characters would be on stage with each other. The power of the fandom is greater than we know. Your eyes are intimidating is unironically one of the best compliments I've ever received, so thank you. And a final shout out to Muhammad Alasmari, sorry if I butchered that, for asking me how I'm doing on every single post that I've made since November. I'm doing good.
thanks for asking. And that's gonna be it for this video. Again, just a blanket statement, do not go after the showrunners. I know I made a lot of jokes at their expense, but I'm sure it was not their fault. John Telligan, if you're watching this for some reason, no hard feelings. I really admire you as a Race to the Edge writer. And if you'd like to contact me and explain some of the stuff that I critiqued, that's welcome also. At the time I'm recording this, John Telligan is my only Twitter follower, so that's interesting. But anyways, again, if you're not subscribed, please consider doing so. I hope you enjoyed the video. I know it took a long time for me to make, but I just get really passionate about this stuff anyways, especially being dragons. If you're still watching this, thanks. Uh, but you should probably go outside or something.